Welcome very, very much uh, um, to Conversations. Welcome to Conversations. A pleasure to welcome to the program Jack Ross, and we have him down as a public intellectual. He is an intellectual of a high order, interested in a great number of interest uh, uh, items in terms of the human condition, <laughs> is very well read, and has just recently completed the writing and publishing of a book. I'll even hold it up here. We're going to leave it here for you to see. It's called Rabbi Outcast. Let's see if you can come in on, if they can come in on this. Rabbi Outcast, and it's uh, Elmer Berger, and, and American Jewish anti-Zionism, which is something that may be upsetting to some people, but this is the book that's out in the bookstores and on the shelves now, and so you can see that. It's just, it's just out at this time, and um, so we're going to be talking about this book in great detail, and even the concept of anti-Zionism among the Jewish community. And Jack, welcome very, very much to the conversation. Great pleasure to welcome. Well, thank, thank you. I've known each other many years, and I, it's a pleasure to finally have reason to be here. Yes, I'm very happy to have you. <laughs> Do you still have that big, tall, black hat? Top hat? Don't oh. you have a tall black hot top hat that you I, I still have it, have it somewhere, yeah. Yeah, that's right. very good. Jack, share with us a little bit your own. We have a number of mutual friends there, Nita Renfro and a number of other major intellectual figures in New York City, and you, I count you one, but could you share your own background, born and raised a little bit, and then we want to get into the book about Elmer Berger, who I also knew, and I could tell the audience that uh, the day after this program with you airs, we had done a program with Rabbi Berger back, I don't know, 20 years or so. We're going to air that. It would be tomorrow from the time they're viewing this program. But share your own book background, born and raised a little bit, and then we'll get into the sub and substance of the book. Well, um, I, I grew up in Bethesda, Maryland, just outside of, of our nation's capital. Um, I... Uh, I was educated in Bar Mitzvah in a conservative synagogue, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and um, I was. There's actually a funny story about how I first ever heard mm -hmm. of Elmer Berger in a Commentary magazine. Uh -huh. uh, writer, some viewers may be familiar with, named Josh Moravchik, mm -hmm. wrote about going on a State Department junket to Saudi Arabia, where. Uh, uh, when he was assured, oh, we have no laws against Jews entering the country, uh -huh. uh, the two he named were, were Berger and, and Henry Kissinger. <laughs> but it was, it was also around, that, that, that also happened to be around the same time I was first struggling to reconnect to Judaism as an adult. Mm -hmm. um, I had just begun to attend a... Uh, uh, I, I suppose unaffiliated uh, progressive co congregation in Brooklyn, where I live and where I've lived for five years. Mm -hmm. um, Had lived for five years. Yeah. I, I've now lived for five years. Okay. I'd only lived there a year at that yeah. time. Okay, right. um, and um, I mean, I had, I had, I suppose, experimented with. Uh, the orthodoxy, the Lubavitch shul when I was in uh, high school, and uh, it took me many years to recover. I, mm. I don't know. I had I had developed an instinctive understanding by a certain point that eighty years ago or a hundred years ago, knowing none of the history, which I go into in considerable detail in this book, I developed an instinctive notion that. Uh, 80 or 100 years ago, I could have been a reform Jew, but not the way things are today. Not knowing any history, um, 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 yeah, not knowing any history, I, ref I had this instinctive notion. So when I first heard of Elmberg, I had already learned a considerable amount about uh, uh, the original anti-Zionism of Reform Judaism in the 19th century. Okay. Um, and or and the larger outlook of what was called classical reform Judaism. Okay, these are things we want to talk about. I wonder if we go back up a little bit. The family setting. 
You were ra born into a Jewish family. You said you were born. Oh, yes. Was, yes. was it intellectually oriented? Was the Judaism a main issue around the dinner table and that kind of thing? Around the said? dinner table. And your early education. I don't know. My, yeah. Well, I guess, first of all, my parents divorced when I was seven. Okay. Um, my mother was raised in a... Uh, um, <laughs> Was, was raised at uh, what was then a modern or mainstream reform temple in D.C. at the time that the reform movement was first becoming uh, overwhelmingly Zionist, though her mother, it turns out, in Pittsburgh attended, uh, Cog grew up with a rabbi who later became the rabbi of Temple Emmanuel here in New York wow. when she was a girl who was featured in the book. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Um, and your father? Uh, my, he was also, I think, raised reform. It was my father who mm -hmm. became very... Uh, who, who became very uh, 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 decidedly Jewish and Jewish when so much of his family mm -hmm. uh, ended up becoming uh, more or less assimilationist. Um, uh, but my father's grandfather, in my namesake, was a Bundist. Mm -hmm. And I understand to his dying day insisted he was not a Zionist. Oh, really? as a, he, was a, so he was a socialist and atheist. But, mm -hmm. and, uh, but and the he was obviously extremely culturally Jewish. This is my great yeah. grandfather. And that was coming from what part of Europe? Or, or uh, he was, was from uh, from Germany? Poland, uh, uh, Lomzhogobernia, I guess, has yeah. been yeah. the region of Poland. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they had come in and that immigration. So I'm not really familiar. I'm familiar with the Orthodox tradition. And then you have conservative, and then you have reform. Maybe you could make the distinction. Your family seemed to be within the reform. Well, uh, both my parents tradition. were raised reform. My father say, became yeah. conservative, mm -hmm. and that prevailed mm -hmm. when I was, uh, and that prevailed when as as we were growing up. Mm -hmm. um, what distinguishes them? The the view of the because we, we we do have within the Christian world we have the Protestants and Catholics and there's certain doctrinal things. But what distinguishes the Orthodox from the Reform? And there's a tendency within the broad intellectual world for there to be a move towards secularism. How does the Jewish traditions relate to the secularist move as the advance? Well, the I'll start. I'll I'll start with. Uh, you understand? Uh, yes. Yeah. I'll, I'll start with the history of the Reform movement as it, it relates to okay. uh, this book. The Reform movement was. Uh, was essentially a product of the German Enlightenment okay. in the early 19th century mm -hmm. and was already very much in decline in Germany by the time it was brought over to America in the second half of the 19th century. What characterized it? Or what was the basic um, or view of things that well, as a movement? Uh, um, well, the official statement of doctrine was only written and published in 1885 mm -hmm. and that was known as the Pittsburgh Platform and um, they uh, they um, they considered null and void all laws relating to diet, priestly, purity and dress meaning mm -hmm. they would not cover their heads or wear other things they would not keep co they would not keep kosher they would not <coughs> and then as far as how they perceived their, their Jewish identity and which leads directly to, into anti-Zionism, they said, uh, I, I believe I can quote this exactly, we consider ourselves no longer a nation but a religious community and therefore expect neither a return to Palestine <coughs> nor a sacrificial worship under the sons of Aaron nor the restoration of any of the laws relating to the Jewish state. I see, okay, okay, okay. And that was an issue that was in the air then? Is that, uh, well, th um, Theodore Herzl, Herzl only Herzl. wrote published uh, <coughs> Isaiah Udenstadt in 1896, but mm -hmm. uh, there were, uh, th there was already some talk of, um, of, of Jewish nationalism and 
and even of, uh, uh, Im of immigration to Palestine in the name of Jewish nationalism. Uh, um, I mean, really, the earliest forefather of Jewish nationalism was was, was, was someone was named was Moses Hess, mm -hmm. who was a contemporary of Karl Marx. Before, uh, with him in many ways, you could say Mo Moses Hess was the first neoconservative oh, to really? to break with to 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 have broken with Marx and Engels themselves, and then to have gone on to develop theories of of, of nationalism. Um, but, at the, but also contemporary with Hess was Heinrich Greitz, mm -hmm. who began to, if you... Um, Is all Germany or...? Uh, mo for the most part, yeah, right, yes. Okay, and okay. Um, mm -hmm. you, you've had Shlomo Sand on your, on your recently, show. He's young yes. man, yeah, relatively. And young. he's written an absolutely vital and important book, which I urge all, uh, all our, our viewers to, to, to read. And he, he goes into... He goes into the 19th century origins of Jewish nationalism in considerable detail. Yeah, he's in a the real view scholar, of yeah. yeah, in the view of both, uh, but in the view of both Orthodox and Reform Jews during the 19th century and into the into the early 20th century, um, Zionism was. Um, Zionism, Zionism or Jewish nationalism before the name Zionism really took hold uh, was considered uh, uh, a reject was was considered a rejection of religion of God of God and a worship of a a secular uh, God. Um, Sands once gave a talk mm -hmm. in which he invoked the example of Charles Marat, who is a French fascist intellectual mm -hmm. who, who uh, advocated an avowedly atheist Catholic traditionalism. Mm -hmm. But it turns out that that comparison mm -hmm. was actually first made uh, in a book in 1951 by Will Herberg, who was, mm -hmm. who was, uh, who was one of the earliest and most thorough Interpreters of Martin Buber and oh, wow. uh, a, a uh, and probably the philosopher of Judaism I personally tend to identify with most. W w Will Herberg was okay. his name. The book the book was called Judaism and Modern Man. Can you put me in touch with that over the telephone later? Um, I mean, with that because it, it seems to be yes. important. I wonder. I'm not Jewish in that, but don't they have a <laughs> thing called a seder? And in the seder they say, or don't they say in some of the rituals or the thing? Uh, next year in, 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 in Zion? Or next, next year, year in, in Jerusalem. In next year in right. Jerusalem. So does that go way back into the myths of history and so forth? So the idea of a return to Zion and also maybe to the idea of the end time, a messianic tradition seemed to be something that maintained identity among the Jewish people through uh, long centuries of existence and so forth. Is that got relevance in terms of this? and? Was it a, was it a, do you understand what I'm saying or not? Isn't that part of the Judaic tradition or is that overplayed or is that not correct or could you set me straight on that basic well, issue? The messianic vision. It is, it, it, it is. Uh, and return to Jerusalem. It, it's, uh, I mean, that is certainly the, 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 how you end the traditional uh, Passover Seder. Mm -hmm. um, it, I, I mean, certainly the, certainly the me that was that expressed the historical messianic idea in Judaism. Now, yeah, throughout right. the Middle Ages, yeah. there were all the, I mean, there were many different messianic movements that emerged at various times yeah. over the many se several centuries of the Middle Ages, and they would, okay, they would, and they would at times have very different ideas. I mean, there was, there were though, I mean, there, and there were very opposite conclusions about how to hasten the Messiah. There were, uh, there were those, I mean, the most uh, active period, uh, probably, you could even call it the climax in the uh, 17th century. The, uh, there were, the most popular, the most, the largest of the messianic movements, which was, which was led by uh, um, 
a Turkish Jew na named Shabzai Tzvi. They mm -hmm. believed the Jews must ingather in Palestine, whereas there were at that time many who were very fiercely opposed to the movement, not necessarily for rejecting uh, the messianic idea, messianic fervor, but a number of them had been followers uh, uh, decades earlier of of uh, Manasseh ben Israel, who was a Spanish Jew in England and was is credited with uh, convincing Oliver Cromwell to issue his emancipation of the Jews. But he believed that the Jews had to be completely dispersed across the entire globe before to to hasten the coming of the Messiah. Uh -huh. um, so, and that is just one example of many cases where very opposite ideas of how one would hasten the Messiah took hold in the Middle Ages. Um, yeah, and, and the idea of that, if I may, in the, in the, in the monotheistic traditions, and then we, we have, uh, a dis, uh, we have you, t you mentioned Lubavitch, you know, and Shearson. Right, and yeah. And then also the orthodox view, and then we have Natura Carta as it relates to things where they are very upset with the uh, ingathering in Israel because that is not to be done before the appearance clearly of the Messiah and that it's a blasphemy to try and do something, pick up and hasten it beyond what the normal pattern is. But the idea of there being a future uh, coming of, uh, of a new order uh, is uh, we, the Christians would say that the Messiah was Christ. And, uh, but then they do also now say that the Christ is coming again. So it's got this idea of a future orientation. And then in the Islam, particularly in Shia, they've got the 12th Imam, the hidden Imam. That's a messianic view of the relationship of the contemporary to the future. And that messianic view is something that is um, unique to, or, or, or is identified with the raison d'etre, as it were, of the Jewish community over the centuries, isn't it? And it's an important issue, right? Well, to bring it back to yeah, we got to um, get to Rabbi. Uh, well, well, bring, to bring it back to the book, um, one could have. Um, I, I think it's best for purposes of this discussion to leave aside purely religious and theological speculation okay. about okay. Okay. about the nature of the Messiah. But yeah. the pr what what uh, what what. Um, what both the Orthodox and Reform agreed on mm -hmm. in the 19, in, in before I, into, the, into the early 20th century was against a secular political messianism, that a secular or political movement mm -hmm. could serve the fun, serving the, the function of um, of the Messiah, and that that, yeah. that was that. However, however, very different, uh, or Orthodox and Reform views were of of God and of and and of the Jewish religion. Yeah, like they a, agreed. They yeah. both agreed that a, that for a secular movement to to Claim use that. to to was. They both proposed any. I have secular movement. Yeah, it would be spiritual. It would be a, an elevated state. It would be. Right. It would yeah. be an elevated new order that would be characteristic of that, not just something who's got too many guns to be able to enforce the, the political sol solution. And uh, and as you know, was there was somebody Balt Tov or Balt for the Orthodox? Baal Shem Tov. Baal Shem. He was the founder of Hasid. Of yeah, the Hasidic right. Hasid movement. in that, and that they were. Uh, you know, uh, keeping the the traditions that are in everything, and then that 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 to pick up arms and to take that kind of a position rather than have a, a, a an a, an elevated condition of the world or the you know it was blasphemy. I mean, from the but the reform, the reform. We were moving in a secular direction in the world, in a very real sense in that. So I'm just trying to get it straight, and we got to get to Elmer Berger and the anti-American anti-Zionism. If 
I'm sorry. I'm just going as a. Well, I, I can I can uh, start uh, I I can start and and talk a little bit about about the history of, of, that I, I I discuss in the book and lead that into the question you okay. ask. Um, mm -hmm. In um, so it, it start, Z Zionists began to enter the reform movement uh, in significant numbers probably beginning in the 1920s. Um, and a lot of this came after the uh, B Balfour Declaration, 14, which was in 1917 during World War I. Like so the key point to understand, and which has not been, I mean, very little, I mean, there's a lot of significant original research in this book, I must say, very little. The only published dissertation only took it up to 1948 and not after 1948. Um, but the key point to me seems to be that the uh, changing, that Zionism became a growing influence in the reform movement because the, because the changing nature of American Jewish identity, that, the Jew, that, that uh, they were not simply, um, to use the most antique phrase that was used, Americans of Jewish faith, that they were not simply Americans of Jewish faith but belonged to some transnational Jewish people. That, became, that change was inextricably linked to America's rise as a world power. Okay, when, yeah, uh -huh. Brit when Great Britain issued the Balfour Declaration mm -hmm. and the creation of Jewish state was at least as a matter of principle, it's, it's a lot more complicated than yeah, that. Sure. Your, your interview in 1989 with Elmer Berger, he talks all about the diplomacy around the, the Balfour Declaration and, uh -huh. and what immediately followed. Mm -hmm. But when, it, at, least, at least in theory and in principle, when the Balfour Declaration was issued, the creation of a Jewish state became official policy for the allies and for the Western democracies. And even though the United States never joins the League of Nations, mm -hmm. uh, the Congress passed a, a, re a resolution. It was a non-binding resolution, but nevertheless, in 1922, saying that they supported that policy independently of their of, of uh, any and any of the, the mandate of, of the League of Nations. Yeah, there was an interesting thing on C-SPAN today about the Balfour. Uh, the fellow, I can't do it now, a, a, a writer, the way that was done. Where right, there is a she, book. I the can't, the name escapes me. Writer, the guy, English, yeah. who writes very, very well, really. Yes. And it escapes me too, but I saw him on television the other day about how that happened, and it was a trade off against some sort of a thing that would be like at a poker table or something. Right, like that right. Done, rather than maybe reflecting some deep philosophical. Well, anyway, that's another issue. So, history can be a little bit. Right. So, funny. naturally, this question became all the more pertinent and exacerbated with the onset of, of World War II. Mm -hmm. um, it, when the war broke out and the United States was still ne neutral, the World Zionist Organization moved, set up what was called the American Zionist Emergency Council mm -hmm. in order to, uh, well, the theory was uh, this is our in, to ensure our survival in the neutral country with the largest Jewish population. Mm -hmm. And that organization is today known as APAC, mm -hmm. American Israel Public Affairs Committee. Extremely powerful union, uh, lobbying. <laughs> oh, yes. That's yes. the most powerful. Maybe some and, oil in the um, might be stronger. But now, the other thing that happened. They have a tremendous influence. When the, when the, Amer when the American Zionist Emergency Council was founded, was that they create they they were they succeeded in merging what was called the United Palestine Appeal mm -hmm. with um, the the uh, um, 
the philanthropic arm of the American Jewish Committee, which was known as the Joint Distribution Committee. And historically, the American Jewish Committee had been anti-Zionist or non-Zionist. And how that changed into the, over the course of many years into the 50s is a rather complicated story I go into in the book. That's what you're yes, but, though, but those two organization yeah. Mertens merged mm -hmm. to form the United Jewish Appeal. Oh, right. Which is right. time when... And, the major objection of the American Council for Judaism and probably their major reason for continuing to exist after the founding of the State of Israel mm -hmm. was because the UJA would refuse to separate its Zionist funds from general philanthropic funds. Huh. Okay. And yeah. so all, any contribution was implicated in state building in Israel with all that that implied. Mm -hmm. that not, it was not a huge concern. They were aware of it, however, the, what, uh, what it meant uh, with respect to, to the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. Although they certainly raised those questions, but that was, though it must be said, that wasn't their primary concern. Mm -hmm. um, now, the, now, now well, let, let's the Ameri to, so yes, yeah, Elber, let's okay, so Elber, Elber Berger, Berger was, Elber. The, was the first executive mm -hmm. director and, well, really the executive director for its entire active existence from 1943 to 1968 of the American Council for Judaism. Okay. Now, that was formed by several reform rabbis, um, one of whom was his boyhood rabbi in Cleveland, Ohio, was the person who really got the ball rolling, and his name was Louis Woolsey. But, and that's where yes, uh, Elmer Berger was yes. from, Cleveland? That's originally, yes. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay. And, West, yeah. Um, and the initial impetus was as soon as America entered World War II, mm -hmm. it was uh, the, it, the reform movement, which was still... They had been pushed into declaring themselves neutral on Zionism in the 30s, but mm -hmm. without having gone any further than that, as soon as the war began, they adopted a resolution uh, calling on uh, the British to raise an exclusive, uh, a, what was called an army of Palestinian and stateless Jews. In other words, an a, an exclusively Jewish military in Palestine that would was would clearly after the war be uh, the basis upon which a state could be built, and this that, was that, that within reform. The, this was a resolution support in favor of this. Yeah, that passed the body of reform rabbis. It was after that resolution passed that uh, the 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 anti-Zionist rabbis decided they needed to form their own organization. And Al Elmer Berger was one of them? Yes. And one of the leaders. And what was their thinking? That there was this uh, idea of nationalism based upon these secular values? Or what was the thinking of the of them that formed that? Elmer Berger, as he said, American Jewish, Jewish anti-Zionist. Yeah. Well, they what believed... What their it, philosophy and their thinking? Well, it was, as I said, about mm -hmm. the nature of Jewish identity going back mm -hmm. to the founding of the reform movement mm -hmm. and the idea there was also a feeling I mean there was obviously an awful lot of of, of demagoguery with the specter of, of Nazism throughout this whole oh, yeah, right. period yeah, of course. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. about uh, I mean there are even today those who who argue oh the um, oh Hitler was what you got after when the Jews tried to assimilate and be be patriotic well, God, Germans, you know, but that out. was, but they, they they believed and could argue quite passionately and in my view, convincingly in the final analysis that 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 the I that you that that was uh, that that was a very fundamental and dangerous concession to Hitler, that uh, the Jews. Yeah. Were that the, that the, that the Jews were a nation or yeah. race or what mistaken. have you, and I. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Now, but now the other important point is about 
what this meant in American politics. I mentioned that APEC can trace its origins to the American Zionist Emergency Council of 1939. Mm -hmm. um, in 1943, there was convened what was called the American Jewish Conference. And this conference purported to be a representative governing body of all American Jew Jewry. It constitutionally committed them to the Zionist program, the Zionist agenda. And the what and this is some this is a point that uh, another person I know you've interviewed you had on the show before he died once died was Israel Shahak. And this was oh, something yes. uh, I, this was I tried to find that to air this week. I got I gotta see if they've lost it over here, the program. Well it's on YouTube. Yeah, it's on YouTube, but that's not the same as airing it. But yeah, Israel Shahak was a close associate of uh, of um of uh, 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 of um, Norton Mazinski, right? Who was of who was very close to Elmer Berger and Shahak mm -hmm. was it was a great admirer of uh -huh. uh, of of Berger, but mm -hmm. uh, but he, he talked a great deal about the rabbinical despotism, Orthodox despotism of the ghetto, Orthodox or despot and the degree to which it was backed up by. The, by 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 the authorities of the old order. Mm -hmm. This was what the what uh, Refor Reform Judaism was in great measure originally conceived as a rebellion against that civil authority mm -hmm. of Orthodox rabbis in favor yeah. of Enlightenment Chad values. Wrote a book, three thousand years of religious uh, right. weight of three thousand right. years. But of he but mm -hmm. this is what and but so it was in. Keeping with that, that the uh, that the reform rabbis of the classical school viewed with great alarm the idea of well, Peter Beinart has written, wrote this essay a year ago that got a lot of attention to the American mm -hmm. Jewish establishment, yeah. and that they saw the existence of, mm -hmm. of right, yeah, really, that yeah. that establishment of that establishment which the Ameri with which the American Jewish Conference in nineteen forty three really was the origin of and in later years was taken with absolute seriousness its authority as such by many uh, Zionist uh, operators. Yeah. But this was what they believed yeah. this was what they saw uh, saw as a resurrection uh -huh. of that uh, old order uh, Corporatized Jewish existence. Now, it, now I, I would just, I just, just want to make one point about Israel Shahak in this connection. He was wonderful. Since I he's brought a up, he of has Noel been Chomsky too. He's a very good right. Friend of Noel he has been Jeff. accused Beautiful. of. He has been accused of some a, absolutely outlandish things. I won't, but <laughs> I won't go in and uh, and outrageous very things. Very straight talker. Yeah. Yeah. I. Um, I mean, I have my criticisms of him both methodologically and also, and also uh, uh, philosophically, or much as I detest the word ideologically. Mm. Um, but he, but the point is, is that he ha he's someone who needs to be honestly understood for what he was, and that is, um, <laughs> as, and that is, as a representative of the earliest and most extreme and avowedly anti-religious uh, uh, tendency of the of, of the uh, what was called the Haskalah, the Jewish Enlightenment uh -huh. and that is I mean that is not a Jewish self-hatred now this is a I suppose this is another question I do have a seg a, there is a part of the book where I talk about this question and how much anti-Semitism, or a lot of what's called Jewish anti-Semitism, which Jewish is certainly yeah. uh, very salient to this book, is it's certainly something the American Council for Judaism was accused of. This really has its origins in, well, for, well as I say, the case of Shahak going back to the Jewish Enlightenment, what it really stood for. Mm -hmm. But um, 
What's the Jewish Enlightenment? Uh, I, I'm not familiar with. Also, you well, that was I, I guess the, the key figure of Shark that was, was Moses Mendelssohn, and mm -hmm. I talk about the German when, when, Enlightenment, when, when are you 18th about? century into the 19th century. Okay. I talked earlier mm -hmm. about the about the yeah. uh, about the founding of the reform, reform movement yeah, in right, Germany. Right. You've got a you got a glowing thing here by Mersheimer. John Mersheimer, the guy yes, from uh, Chicago. Yes, and he and another fellow in the New York Review of Books wrote a very telling article. It was a London oh, Review of Books, yes. It was, it was London? No, it was New York. No, it was a London Review. Was, there was another one. Well, anyway, and then they wrote a book. Yeah, they wrote a book. Uh, right. right. And they're very critical in that. Right. And I wonder about that. We, do, you, do you know Lenny Brenner around town? You know, yeah, right? I, I... Lenny's yeah. written well on the fact that... Uh, the Because you're talking about national. You're talking about a political nationalism rather than in terms of the Zionist idea to set your own state and so forth. And you're right, I, and Lenny t tells me that during the, even the Nazi time, uh, there was a collaboration between the Nazis and the Zionists because there was a desire to have the Jews removed to Palestine. Well, that's a separate, that's a separate and issue, but it's not an flew. unrelated issue, this I guess. David flew in Nazi Germany, well, what, along with the swastika. Well, what Is that correct, or do you know? Oh, I don't know about that. Well, that's what Lenny says, Specifically. Right? I, I have what, his book. I, oh, I yeah. don't... One other thing I want to ask you. What is... Maybe we got only a little time left. Or what, what has been the source of anti-Semitism uh, over the ages, let's say? It could be this idea about the Christ or something, a killing Christ or something. But, I mean, in real terms, what is it... Because I, in my own thinking... I don't know what's not to like. The Jewish community uh, is an anti. Is there something anti-intellectual abroad in the world? Because the Jewish community and the people that make it up seem to be so intellectually curious and co and contributive to improving the human condition throughout the ages. They've been so scholarly and intelligent. Is there is there an anti-intellectual bias? that uh, targets or scapegoats them because they're such a, uh, uh, a, 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 a as a community, contributors. If, if you're talking of about... the human condition and understanding of science yeah. and art and everything, why is there been anti-Semitism? Where in the world uh, does it come from? If, well, uh, for purposes of this discussion, I need to leave out the thousand plus years of classical or Christian anti-Semitism, and in the later manifestations of that, yes, anti-intellectualism, anti no doubt, had, had, was, was a part of it, but... Um, okay, that's important, because I think well, that anti-intellectualism going in, in the world In modernity, now. in yeah, modernity. Okay, yeah, right. Um, I mean the know nothing party we had. Well, that they were they were anti-Catholic. They were anti-Catholic. Well, okay. Not yeah, but you understand what I'm saying? Well, yes. What's not to like about the Jewish community? I can't understand it. They're uh, well, all Amish. The they're whole all very thoughtful. Jews as individuals. They're intelligent. They're Jews as individuals. I mean, as a but often, very often are wonderful people. Absolutely. Uh, but well, if you believe in the, the existence of an official community, this yeah. was my point yeah. about. Uh, about what Peter Beinart called the American Jewish Establishment, uh -huh. and which originated in the American Jewish Conference in mm -hmm. 1943. But to get back to anti-Semitism... Yeah, we got to get to Kurt Berger. Right? In, well, we have talked about in modernity. In, in modernity, I think anti-Semitism uh, very often was... And, Again, anti-intellectualism is what largely feeds into it. Okay, the Jewish important. Enlightenment rhetoric, I think what began in the 19th yeah. century was the Jewish Enlightenment rhetoric uh, was picked up by unsophisticated Gentiles who used it for yeah. their own anti-intellectual okay. arguments. Okay. And I, um, and in the last century, in the last couple of generations, a lot of critiques of Zionism and the American Jewish establishment, such as that, those that were typified by Berger, probably were picked up by a number of very unsophisticated people, and this became and this. But this is what is associated with anti-Semitism: the idea that that 
any kind of liberal Jewish, Jewish liberal, Jewish idea in itself is a species of Jewish self-hate or Jewish anti-Semitism. Why don't they talk about uh, Presbyterian self-hate? Why don't they talk, <laughs> why do they bring up this thing about self-hatred and that, I can't quite understand, there's something unique about that, there's all kinds it of... It is, well, okay, this is because, of, this is know, because they it? have, this is because, this is because uh, Shahak talks about this up to, up to a point, I think, yeah. but it's oh, because what? of the ideal of the collective okay. and, mm -hmm. anti, and the, the anti-individualist idea. This goes back very far in the orthodox theories of nationalism, as we talked about earlier. The I think that was... The Jewish nationalism with the emergence of Jewish Mr. nationalism. Berger, yes. That it was becoming a nationalist identity. Yes. Yeah, right, okay, yeah. And, I mean... I, I say this in the epilogue, and I think it's true that fundamentally um, the heresy of the heresy of classical reform, first it was against orthodoxy, but then against Zionism, was the idea that a Jew could be an individualist and not just, not just that it was possible, but that, that perhaps it was essential, that after all that was essential to... Uh, to the uh, prophetic tradition okay. in Judaism, back going to back the to the prophetic. biblical yeah, right. prophets. Yeah, well, Martin King said that we'll get to the promised land at that speech in Memphis, you know. Right. So the idea that there can be a moment of transformative, qualitative, um, qualitative elevation of the entire context is not something that I, it seems to me should be seen as um, subversive or something. But do you understand what I mean? With the, the idea, it's inherent in evolution, isn't it? You have a, an evolutionary process where you have steady state for a long, maybe millions of years or something, and then there's what they call punctuated equilibrium. Something new emerges. There's an emergence of, do you understand what I'm saying? So the idea of having a, a rendezvous with a future where there's going to be justice in a world where there's elemental injustice all over the place and so forth, is not something that should be um, derided. Uh, the, 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 mess, mess, the messianic uh, uh, vision. Well, no, you I mean, certainly what the... What, what's with people thinking? I don't know. Because <coughs> we may be at a moment of qualitative transformation in the evolution of consciousness in these very <laughs> days. You know who says that? Uh, Isaac Asimov said, this is the defining generation that we're coming to a time of qualitative transformation in terms of uh, the technological realities and geopolitics and so forth. And uh, this may be, in fact, the time of the fulfilling of 200,000 years of human evolution in this particular... Well, on that note, saying, yeah, know? on that note, right, I, I suppose I should focus on one very small part of that, which, <laughs> which uh, relates yeah. directly to this book, which okay, is please, yeah. what's happening in the American... Jewish community today, okay, good, and good, which good. is lar Bring it down to largely why I wrote this book to good. put what is happening in historical perspective. Okay. Um, and where where I should begin, I'm not sure. Mm. Um, now, because there is so much mysticism, and this really is my answer to your question about anti-Semitism: why there is anti-Semitism, why ev so everything about recent Jewish history is so wrapped up in mysticism. Okay, the, and yeah. this, is, this is what sad mm -hmm. is so vital, so vitally responding to. Mm -hmm. And as Tony Jew to the book is dedicated to, mm -hmm. uh, what, uh, undoubtedly uh, one of the great, one of, I mean, as, as I've written before, Tony Jute, it really is no exaggeration to compare him to Orwell. He stood virtually alone in in say in recognizing and saying that it is neoconservatism, not Islam, mm. that is the heir and successor to 20th century totalitarianism. Pretty interesting. But he, yeah. but, mm. uh, but as he said in his praise of Shlomo Sand's mm. book, mm. It, it normalizes Jewish history. It does away with the implausible myth of the wandering people for 2,000 years. Mm. That after, 
after or a, after suffering at the hands of such mystical hatred, restored to their ancient homeland, and as he puts it, reintegrates Jewish history into the general history of mankind. All right, yeah. But um, um, I mean, because of because of there were because so much of American Jew, the Jewish community's understanding of itself became so wrapped up in this mysticism. In there were, mysticism. In, as I said, well, it's yes. a secular mysticism, okay. as I was talking, you as I, I was talking about stuff, earlier. It's, 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 well, and, yes, when I talked about it's what they right. would call in the political di a narrative. Yes, you, yeah, yeah, you right. could say that. Yeah, um, um, and it's very firmly held. Yes, but because of that mysticism, any attempt, which was very little to try to un understand Berger and his colleagues mm -hmm. at all, mm -hmm. um, was said, oh, how do you explain these self-hating Jews, their psychological maladies they must have? And I believe, or how, did, how do you explain the reformed Jewish anti-Zionism? My answer to that is they, my answer essentially is they identified with, they, their, their Jewish identity was very much associated with an America that predated imperial America, the old America, mm -hmm. a republic, not an empire, as, yeah. as some might say, mm -hmm. and that because, and that the experience of Ameri America, Russia being the savior of the Jews in World War II, yeah. and this is the founding myth of the American Empire. This that we we America fought the greatest war in history to save the Jews, and very old theological ideas about about the children of Israel certainly play into this, and we restored them to their rightful homeland. We brought, this is the, we the American Empire brought about the redemption of Israel, which, which. The people would die yeah, into yes. that now, yeah. This right, is, yeah. Uh -huh. and this is what mm. I say, the sacred story of Jewish. Exceptionalism. Yes, yeah. the sacred story of Jewish nationalism is also the sacred story of American nationalism. Mm -hmm. And oh, these were Jews, yes, so tight, and these yeah. were Jews mm -hmm. whose very Jewish identity mm -hmm was wrapped up in, was associated with a very different America, uh -huh. an America that was at peace with the world. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that is... Up to about 1980? 1980, oh, much, going back much further than oh, that. Oh, I'm sorry, you're talking in a different loop. Yes. W when are you talking about? Are you t turn of the century, 19? What, what, what America are you talking about? I don't well, before you... World War II, before if, World not War II even okay. more, if, if not even further back. Okay. I mean, that was, World War II was what, ma is, was what made America a superpower. Mm. Well, it was after World But it was because, after, yeah, but that right, experience yeah. Yeah, yeah, transformed yeah. American mm. Jewish identity. Well, and is. they could not, and these were people who, did not, who could not accept that, that transformation and saw the problems with it. And I, and I believe yeah. fundamentally this is what's happening among a lot of young Jews today who okay. are rediscovering its... Uh, Style of Jewish practice that is very that is very different from the classical reform, but in substance it's mm -hmm. very similar. In in uh, Judaism is a religion. It is a, it is a religion. Judaism is a religion and not about and not uh, and not primarily about the political imperatives of the transnational entity called the Jewish people. Uh, transnational. And that is what, it, well, and they, there's a lot of alarm about this. There's the term cosmopolitan for Jew, right? Over the yeah, that's, 19th century, they call, yeah. and that would be transnational rather than nationalism that was growing. So that seemed to be, maybe that's one of the sources of uh, 
of upset with them or the anti-Semitism or whatever. Well, this is now the technology is turning us into a global village. But this is what Sad says. This yeah. is how Sad yeah. begins his book by explaining that as far as the Israeli government is concerned, mm -hmm. there is no such thing as an Israeli or an Israeli people, only the transnational Jewish people. Mm -hmm. And but what is but no, there I mean, I suppose it might be fair to say that the edge, that, that, well, there's a lot of sociological change. A yeah. big part of it is obviously intermarriage in the Jewish community. That's going and so on big time. there's a lot of disaffection of people just becoming disaffected. There, and a larger number of Jews my age are simply drifting away from Judaism altogether and certainly from the Jewish collective. But th those that do yeah. take Judaism seriously uh -huh. and want to create mm -hmm. a progressive alternative for Jewish religion by and large mm -hmm. are very much driven by religious motivations mm -hmm. and, and it also, also the extraordinary number of young Jews involved in uh, advocating for justice uh, for for the Palestinians. Well, they don't seem to be very that. They seem to be they, Mr. 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 And they Netanyahu and company are doing what the hell ever they want on the West Bank. They're expanding and they're just going to build a great big garden and they're just uh, dancing in great joy at just having control <laughs> over everything and nobody can tell them any different. And they got a narrative that is so dangerous and they got something between 200 and 300 atomic bombs. But that's it's very. It doesn't look to me like that peace movement, peace now or something. Is able I am to not. Oh, I am not talking about peace well, now. You what I am not talking about. Okay. You, I'm not talking about. And I'm. I mean, I, that is a a progressive Zionist. That, that is a that is a movement that very much adheres to uh, to to Zionist first principles. And that I'm talk. I was talking about people who. who Organizations like Jewish Voice for Peace, and the, the they and these are well. Who's Jewish Voice for Peace? I don't know. Rabbi Takun, uh, that kind of thing. Rabbi Lerner. Uh, I, Who are you yeah, talking yeah, about? Yeah, yes. Or peace well, in that, but it right. doesn't seem to have much effect over the geopolitical. Well, reality. okay. Let me get to that okay. then. Let me get to that then. As far as as I said earlier, the founding myth of the American Empire, of which Israel is the ultimate symbol, you might call it the tabernacle of the American Empire of America. American nationalism, uh, at which American nationalists worship. I don't want anyone to mistake me for saying I don't buy, this means I don't buy Walton Mearsheimer and the existence of the Israel lobby. Far from it. Walt, All somebody named Walt? Steve Walt, who yeah, co-wrote right, the book right, with Mearsheimer. Right, 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 right. I don't want anyone to confuse this with saying I do not, that because I, because, because there is this, um, there is this otherworldly and mystical element to uh, the place of I the role of Israel in American nationalism doesn't mean that there's no Israel lobby. Far from it. No all Israel all lobby state religion. All state. Yes. All state religion. All state religions have needed have needed brutal and zealous enforcers for history. And yeah. American nationalism slash Jewish nationalism is no exception. The two are joined at the hip. Y yes. They. And they've that may be a problem because right. the United States might be in trouble. Or their vision. Or their well, vision that's right. That's exactly vision. right. Because and now the American the empire, is our, that our now the American empire is is collapsing. We see it. In, I hope you can see that. Yeah, very well. That they're coming to the end of the <laughs> the assumed historical legitimacy of that model is now being tested by the realities that are emerging. Well, just yesterday, the pr the president gave his speech announcing the beginning of withdrawal from Afghanistan. That was very, that was a very, yes, no, I agree. Yeah. I agree, but by, this, but by the same token, one should, acknowledge, one should acknowledge it for the reality that it represents mm. and that, uh, and certainly the neocons have certain, have, um, Did you see? I didn't have, think. have, have oh. been, have gotten hysterical about it. Um, no, I don't have it here. Oh. Go ahead. No, no, no. No, that's all right. Um, I had a thing I was going to show. Did you see the Wall Street Journal that they had the thing where they combined Obama and Bush, the face? 
Uh, I'll show it in the Was notes. that today? No, it was a couple days ago. It was really good. And they're talking about, the, the, it's just a continuation. Yeah, I don't know. And it's, the spirit of the neocons still live in the Senate, don't they? And what we're doing and so forth. I don't know. I, mean, I think it's, uh, this is a, this is a, we're getting a bit we're getting into off politics. track yeah, here about, yeah. I mean, I do think it's. Well, the role of Israel. I do, well, I'll talk about, well, why don't I, why don't I on that note talk about. Israel and the position of Israel. Yes. Uh, they made the plan, Mr. Obama. I said, well, just come back to 67, impossible, we're going to build. They're going to, they've got maps that go to Ur in terms of a greater Look, Israel. I think. And those forces are in the saddle, and it's very Look, I think it's, a mis I think it's a mistake to make it about Obama, and I've always had. I've, More Netanyahu, I've lo just I've, does whatever he I've, I've, What I've long felt is that he's giving Netanyahu the rope to hang himself because it's his least bad option. If he really want. He, he, if he really wanted to save the two states illusion, he would be doing more, but he clearly doesn't. Where's it heading? Eventually, I think, uh, I, um, I think you're going to see uh, the Palestinians rise up the way they did in Egypt and well, in other countries. It was sort of like it the is, Indian had a hard time rising up against the well, European colonists who could do whatever well, they wanted well, because they're a superpower. They the whites were they out, want. they had numbers. The white, they had numbers on their side in that other, in, in the case of, no, they had against the... They had technology, they had technology they had but they, they also had, had numbers. Yeah, but that's geopolitics. Who's got the Gatling gun rules? That's all. That's what Israel's doing now. They've got the superpower status, and they're dancing on. Uh, we win. The point the is, of the world, they dare, they have it deeply ingrained in their thing, and they're very dangerous. I and don't disagree people, with that. I okay, don't disagree with that. The, the point States is, is dangerous because they think they have a model for the world, and it's not adequate to what the future requires. The United States and Israel are the most, and the people of the Middle East. If you ask them who are they afraid of, it's the United States and Israel. No, I no don't. Power. I am not disagreeing okay. with. With any okay, of that's that, certainly not. Contemporary contemporary yes, that is the context. The but the, but we only have a couple months but left. The, so the American this. Empire is retreating from the region, uh, however slowly and awkwardly, and with however what's that going on in varying Libya? level of resistance. What's that going on in Libya, where they're dropping uh, predators? They're going to put predators into uh, Yemen. What are they doing? The, the th nearly three million people have been killed in, Ac in Iraq over our idea and so forth. I'm sorry, I don't quite understand that they're retreating, they're expanding, they're putting predators out in every direction like some Roman candle. I mean, I don't see that, that they're retreating or that they've got an enlightened view or a pattern that... I didn't say anything to... about enlightened okay. view. We've only got two... Let's... Re... Okay, sorry, no, gotta... no, 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 I, I, no, let me let me no. Let me conclude... Let me... No, let me just conclude on this note. Look, yeah. obviously... Obviously, it, obviously, the direction which history is going is not on a straight line, but it is clearly yeah, right. going. It is clearly going against America as a world power, uh -huh. and that and that founding myth of the American Empire, the shared sacred story of Jewish nationalism and American nationalism, mm -hmm. which in a word is the Zionist narrative, which is yeah. what American Judaism was transformed into in which Elmerberger and his colleagues yeah, God bless. strove to resist yeah. because that is falling that is all falling apart now and this is as you've said earlier about the what what's what what can be wonderful about us Jews that Jews of my generation are ahead are ahead of the curve they see what is happening they see they need uh, they need to rediscover a progressive alternative. Well said, young man. <laughs> Thank you very much for the book. The book's recommended by one and all Jack Ross. The book is titled Rabbi Outcast <laughs> Elmer Berger.